I am um, the director of the African and African American Studies program at Louisiana State University and also uh, a member of the faculty of the Department of Geography and Anthropology. And I'm going to uh, sort of moderate this panel and um, um, moderate a few more, but uh, even before we, are, we get started, I want to encourage you to really check out the panels that are going to be at this particular stage, because the next three days, today as well as Saturday and Sunday, you can learn quite a bit about Haiti and those uh, Louisiana connections. Um, before I go any further, I would like to introduce the other members of the panel. Uh, to my uh, left, my immediate left, is Mr. Greg Osborne. And I have known Greg for many years, so it's always a pleasure to uh, work with him on one of these panels. We've worked uh, on many festivals. <laughs> uh, Greg is um, uh, finished from uh, Stanford University, and he worked with Women of the Midlow Hall with her book, uh, Colonial, uh, Afri <laughs> Colonial Louisiana, Africanisms in Colonial Louisiana. And um, so he is a, uh, an extraordinary researcher, and uh, he works at Louisiana um, Public Library, but looks, he works in the, what is the, the city archives part of the library. And um, so you might want to check him out if you're doing some serious uh, Louisiana research, because he certainly can help you, believe me. Uh, the next person that I would like to introduce to my far left is Malcolm Suber. And Malcolm was um, one of the main researchers for On to New Orleans. You may have been, be familiar with that book. Uh, he was the main researcher there. He was also a founding member of the Louisiana Museum of African American History. And you may know that museum by its location. It, one, it was once housed in St. Augustine Catholic Church. So now they are looking for a home. Uh, and we hope that they will find one. It's a lot of very valuable materials and artifacts that they have, and uh, we're certainly uh, looking for a home for that museum now. What I would like to do today, uh, as uh, starting off, would be to talk about um, the Haitian Revolution, uh, since that really was the starting point for the large migrations of Haitians that came into Louisiana. Um, just wanted to talk about it and how important it is to look at the revolution, uh, look at that theater, because it was such an important one uh, in the uh, entire history of this state. And I really kind of look at Louisiana as being, uh, particularly New Orleans, as being a Haitian city more than a French city, and believe me, there are differences. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit today, and with, and excuse the, uh, our other competition here, but um, I'll try to speak directly into the mic so you can hear me. And when we finish all three of the presentations, then we will um, have uh, a session for questions and answers. Now, looking at the Haitian Revolution and, and trying to decide why should we look at a revolution? Why should we look at this revolution? I mean, when I first um, heard about this, all I wanted to do was say what and what prompted this revolution and how did these enslaved Africans win against a superpower, a superpower like France? And I was really interested in um, if you want to study anything about Louisiana or Haiti, you have to look at start at least start at the revolution, if not further back. So just to look at some of the um, some of the reasons why we study the Haitian Revolt. For one thing, it was the only successful revolt in this hemisphere of where the slaves actually um, took over the system, uh, overturned the system, you might say. And it was only, the only one recorded in modern history. So that alone should give us a reason for looking at it in a, in a closer way. Also, its impact on the slaveocracies uh, was very dramatic. The ones in Brazil, the ones in Jamaica, Trinidad, wherever, uh, in the diaspora. It was a very dramatic impact because everybody was um, looking and, and taking heed of, you know, of this revolt. Another reason is it motivated and inspired blacks in other parts of the diaspora. Um, you didn't hear about a, a lot of revolts really until after the Haitian Revolt. You know, of course there were some before. But you think about people like uh, Denmark Vesey and uh, Nat Turner. These all happened after the Haitian Revolt. 
And so it really inspired blacks and other areas of the diaspora to, um, you know, to, to, to revolt also. It also had a, a strong effect on the psyche of the planters. I mean, if you, you know, first thing, they underestimated what the Haitians could do. So when they found out that they really could overtake a system, then they began to be worried in other areas of the diaspora. Um, um, so that was another one. Another reason for the success is the revolt helped to explain the reasons for failure in others. When you look at the successes of the revolt, and then of course, you know, it would give you the idea of why some of the others didn't, uh, why some of the others failed. Another reason that it enabled us to study color divisions. Um, there is, you know, of course, those of you who are from Louisiana and have studied Louisiana history certainly know that this has taken a uh, very strong effect on um, culture, politics, and, and so many other things within this area. And so the, it was the same thing through this whole revolt. The color divisions were a major factor in what happened as a result of, um, you know, as, 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 of, of that revolt. And another thing is, of course, um, it basically had international implications around the world. Everybody was looking at the revolt and, and to see why it happened and, and, uh, and why it was successful. Now, going back a little bit uh, before the revolt, we want to look at the, um, the reasons uh, for the revolt. They were, they were really, it was a really complex situation. Of course, we know that the, the French Revolution was going on and the cry for equality, uh, fraternity, um, and uh, equality from the, the French. And you see what was happening there, and you ha also see the divisions of the French in Haiti. You had the Republicans, and then you had the, the Royalists, and these were the people that were loyal to the, uh, to the French. And, and, but they were here in, in Haiti, and they wanted their own independence too. They said, when we were living here, we want to have a, you know, our own president, we want to have our own laws, uh, we want independence. And so it was a, a very difficult and complex uh, situation there. And the other thing was that um, the color division also within, not just within the revolt, but within the, the whole society, of the Haitian society at the time. You had um, in Saint Domingue in 1789, you also have to look at the fact that it was the largest superpower as far as uh, the production it had produced about two thirds of the uh, imports uh, that um, France um, had in overseas trade. So it was a very powerful area as far as economy was concerned. So that's another reason why all eyes uh, were on Haiti during this, this long period. You have to remember that the, um, the revolt actually spanned 13 years. And you're looking at the, um, also the characters in this theater we have at least three U.S. presidents that were involved that um, actually allied with France and, you know, and helped uh, because they didn't, certainly didn't want to see the success of the revolution. So it's quite a bit that was going on. But the greatest, um, uh, Saint-Domingue was the greatest supplier of sugar, of course, in the world at this time. And some of the other crops, coffee, cocoa, cotton, spices, and uh, precious wood. So it was a very valuable colony of France. Now, and you wanna um, sort of compare it sometimes with the American Revolution, French Revolution, I mean, and the Haitian Revolution. You know what was going on there. They wanted independence too and did not want it to be taxed. So it's a taxation without representation, which basically started it. But here in, uh, well, there in Haiti, the revolt was, you know, you see these uh, uneducated and, uh, you know, class of slaves and they were uh, revolting against the tyrannical oppressors. Um, and you know, so a lot of times we just kind of look at the, the differences in between these two, um, these two revolutions. Looking at the um, absolute tax on their bodies and the, the horrific things that were done to their bodies in, in, um, in Haiti. Because we often look at France or the French um, colonies, and particularly uh, uh, Haiti, as being one of the most, um, you, you, you might say that the French 
uh, planters were cut above the rest as far as the horrific things that they did to the human body um, with the slaves. Now, all slavery was bad, but some were worse than others. And um, the situation in Haiti was that uh, most of these folks that started the revolution said, look, I would rather continue to fight and die rather than to go back to those horrific situations. So um, we can see the, the um, situation with both of these uh, revolutions and we try to you know, just look at them and compare them to a certain extent, but also compare the Americans' uh, involvement with that. You know, Americans, uh, US, the British, French, so it was, a, it was one of those um, situations where you have so many people involved and so many other powers that were involved because they did not want it to be a successful revolution. Now, <clears throat> we have um, to look at the success of the revolution and why was it a success? Because it was supposed to fail. It wasn't supposed to be a success. And just to look at some of those reasons, um, I'll just enumerate some of those and then we'll go to Greg and stuff. But one thing was the leadership, uh, the leadership of the uh, officials with the revolution and we could look at people like Toussaint and, and Leclerc and um, Desaline, Christophe, all of these characters, you know, they were better leaders than actually they thought they were. You have uh, also the, the enslaved um, people that were actually fighting the revolution you might say guerrilla warfare. And um, this, they were unestimated. You know, you, they just did not think that they could um, put together and develop strategy, war strategy, to be a superpower like the French. Uh, the division again in rank on, on dealing with the French owners. You know, it was a lot of division there in rank and that also with the division in color but um, there was a division in rank. Again, you have the Royalists uh, against the Republicans. And so there was, uh, when you have your, the, the people that you're fighting are divided, well, you know, you have another problem with that. The division among the commissioners and troops from France. And then of course, we all know about smallpox and how that sort of just wiped out a large part of the French army. Um, we look at, um, not, I said smallpox, but actually it's yellow fever. Now, um, the mulattoes and the blacks uh, finally managed to get together, and that was another reason why uh, that there was uh, success within this revolt. Uh, it took a while for this to happen, but when the mulattoes finally figured out that France was not going to give them their independence, they decided to join in um, with the blacks and with the enslaved um, 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 Haitians. And again, the whole uh, fact that the French did, you know, underestimated the, um, the blacks. And they thought, felt that they were not unified and could not pull this off when it actually did happen. And I guess the last thing would be sort of like the absolute determination of a people, um, of a, oppressed people to win their freedom and when most of them thought that, yes, I would rather be dead than to go back through this. So I, I think these, um, you know, so it was a number of things. It wasn't just one, but it was a number of things that added to the success of the revolution. Now, uh, after the revolution, the United States and Britain, you know, all was trying to still colonize Haiti, but they did not succumb um, to colonization. Um, of course, they certainly suffered afterwards, um, even now being the you say, most um, you know, poverty-stricken uh, country along the, I guess you say, in that list in the world. Um, but it's, the fact still remains that they did not succumb to the, the, uh, being a colony again. Um, and so they would rather would take um, poverty with dignity you might say, than to um, succumb to that. So I'm gonna move um, and pass the baton to Greg, and he's gonna talk about the migration and uh, what happened after uh, the revolution. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Joyce. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna talk about the after effects of the revolution, um, especially here in Louisiana. But as soon as the revolution starts, you have uh, people fleeing some of the planners, some of the free people of color, 
end up on the east coast of the U.S., as far north as Maine, as far south as Georgia, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Norfolk, and they set up these communities. Now, the ones who went to the east coast were more of the white elites, because remember, they can't go back to France. France is in full revolution as well. So they were basically just getting on boats. Some of them, the, the early migration is to the eastern seaboard, but they also went to Jamaica, some of them go to Cuba. And the group that goes to Cuba ends up in New Orleans, particularly in 1809, and the number is given about 10,000 people. And they're, they, they say roughly a third white, a third free people, and then they say a third slave. But a colleague of mine, Rebecca Scott, who teaches up at the University of Michigan, sort of refutes this third slave category, given that when some of these people, before they left Haiti, were freed by the French. And this was in 1793. The French gave a general order abolishing slavery in saint Domingue. So the, the people had left after that 1793, they were already free. Except that once they were in places like Cuba that still had slavery, they were either re-enslaved uh, complicitly, uh, maybe not you know directly, maybe. And again, there wouldn't have been papers to say, to prove your ownership. So these were either former slaves of some of these families, and they were either coerced to go or given the choice to either stay, continue with the revolution, or come with the us who you know, we're gonna to go to Cuba. Um, and so we don't we don't know, but once they show up in New Orleans, their their status as slaves is reestablished. So uh, she would say two thirds were really free people of color. Uh, but again, this one third group is a semi unofficially sort of re-enslaved re again. And there are some who try to, uh, later on in New Orleans, try to petition to say, well, we were actually free before we left, but some of these cases are way after their arrival, so the, um, the New Orleans courts are not recognizing this order of emancipation by, by the French 20, 30 years before some of these people are making it. But they have a, the group has a tremendous impact. They uh, increase, uh, you know, remember, the, we're talking about whites, former planners, uh, working class people. We're talking about a large free population of color. They double the free population of color in New Orleans. And then some of the, uh, the other group were, were, were being treated as slaves or being recognized as enslaved population. So they, they the impact is that they go through all spheres of society in New Orleans. They have a tremendous impact on the sugar industry after the arrival, because that's really when sugar takes off, is after these San Domain people, with their tech, technology know-how on raising sugar for what, about 100 years before their arrival. Um, and in opera, uh, daily newspapers, because uh, remember, some of these people you know, have no resources. They don't have any wealth with them, except some of them are claiming the slave wealth. And if you had a slave, you could hire him or her out. Um, they could earn some income. They could earn some earn income for their owners. Uh, so that's why some of them were, uh, because remember in 1808, the US government was had a ban that you could not import slaves who were, you know, not internationally, who were not domestic. And so the, the U.S. government made an exception to the saint domain to the refugees who were, had slaves with them once they're coming from Cuba. So this was a, an important exception that they made. Um, but, uh, you know, you had some people from Africa who it might have been in Haiti, but when you look at the records, uh, you'll see that in the, the sacramental records, which are the Catholic Church records, the baptisms of uh, people from Saint Domingue are throughout the records for this period. The wills for this period, they'll you know make out their wills, their succession probates. 
from the time of their arrival for 20, 30 years after, and some of them are living 40, 50 years after their arrival. So this continuous impact on cuisine, on music, on architecture is so strong and vital in the development of New Orleans. So George is definitely right. New Orleans is, is, a, is more of a Haitian city. Um, we know that uh, architecture is inspired by the Caribbean. Some of these customs and cultures, uh, you know, the dancing in Congo Square, uh, more of that is probably influenced from the Sagamay people. And when we say Creole, Creole just originally meant native of the colony. If you're using the reason, it was used for an enslaved, for whites, for people of color. So it's not, a, Creole is not about race, it's about the culture he established in the new world of first generation, second generation Africans, first generation, second generation uh, French, and the culture established. So uh, Saint Domingue culture predates Louisiana culture by 200 years, 250 years. So it's a much older Creole culture then coming to New Orleans with the Santa Manga rivals. So their customs, so it's, it's, it's what they really say that re, really what re-creolizes New Orleans. Uh, makes it more Creole city, more Caribbean city, more African city by demographic impact uh, of these people. Because it'd be more of these people than say Americans or other Europeans coming in. You know, Americans are starting to come in, but the Santa Domingue people are really bolstering that Creole, that that culture from the Caribbean, so that you know we don't become we resist being Americanized. So religion, um, all kinds of aspects, that they'll have a tremendous impact. All right. Good, good afternoon. Uh, this year, 2011, happens to be the 200th anniversary of the largest slave revolt uh, in U.S. history, uh, the slave revolt of the German coast in New Orleans that occurred in January of 1811. Uh, and what is important for us to understand in connection with Haiti is that the idea of revolution, the idea of enslaved people freeing themselves was very much in the air in New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans being a port city, uh, New Orleans uh, having an educated uh, class of, of free people of color as well as Africans who had been freed themselves they knew about events around the world. CLR James talks about the black Jacobins in Haiti who embraced the French Revolution. And we believe that the enslaved in Louisiana also embraced the ideas of revolution, embraced the ideas that nobody had the right to enslave another person. And with this thought, with this germination that was kicked off by the Haitian Revolution, there were those in New Orleans, and we say in the Louisiana Museum of African American History that one of the gifts of Haiti to Louisiana was to bring to Louisiana those who had the ideas and the experience of prosecuting a revolutionary struggle. And of particular importance in that regard is the leader of the 1811 slave revolt, uh, a man named Charles Desmond. Uh, we don't know exactly if he was born in Haiti uh, or he came through Haiti, but we do know that at some point either he or his mother was in Haiti and that he knew a great deal about and understood the importance of the struggle of the Haitian people and the establishment of a republic. So uh, Charles Eslon worked for a number of years in secret and organized people up and down the what is called the German coast 
uh, St. Charles and St. John the Baptist Parish and was able to launch a revolt uh, whose aims was to capture the city of New Orleans and to establish a republic as the enslaved people had done in Haiti. Now what is important about them having the outlook that they had to go to New Orleans? We know that at the same time, the Underground Railroad, which was developing in the South, meant that if you wanted to escape, you either became a maroon and lived out in the swamps among the native people and off the swamp, off of uh, stuff in the swamp, or you would go to Mexico. And the fact that they were not planning to go to Mexico meant that they had definite aims of establishing a republic in the territory of Louisiana and having their own government that would free the slaves 50 years before the Civil War. So it's important for us to understand the context in which this uh, revolt took place and the great deal of, of, of importance of the Haitian Revolution in terms of the events here. Now what happened? In, in January 1811, uh, as usual, the uh, planners along the uh, German coast were having their celebration of the sugar harvest. And the tradition there was that each of the big planners would uh, have a ball and invite the other planners to say how much money they had made off the sweat and labor of the enslaved population. At the same time, during that period, after the harvest, this was a slack time on the, uh, on the plantations, and they were not watching over the slaves as intensely as they do during the harvest season. And so uh, the slaves were allowed to visit from one plantation to another, and because one of the concessions that the enslaved Africans had won in Louisiana was that they had Sunday afternoons off anyway. They were able to build a network, especially with the Maroons who lived in the swamps behind the plantations. They were able to build a secret network to actually communicate up and down the river from New Orleans to St. John the Baptist Parish, which is present-day Laplace. They were able to build a network and, and, and exchange communications and organize secretly uh, that they were going to, in fact, pick a time and overthrow the white planters up and down the coast. What is important to also understand is that they understood that the international context of what was happening in Louisiana at the time was that there was pressure from the Spanish in Texas and in West Florida uh, that there may have been outbreaks between the United States and, um, and Spain at any time. So they were taking advantage of the intelligence that they had. And because they had people who worked in the big house, they understood exactly what was going on within so-called white politics. So it's very important that we understand that they were not just people who rose up one day and said, we're gonna, we're gonna revolt, but this was a well-planned revolt. Uh, they, uh, they started it on the Andrew Plantation. Uh, Charles S. Long had been rented out to Colonel Manuel Andry, and uh, he convinced his fellow uh, enslaved persons on that plantation that you should join with us and to prove to everybody else that I'm willing to attack my own master as the first blow. So they struck Andre first. Unfortunately, Andre was only wounded and crossed the river to get reinforcements. Uh, they killed Andre's son and they began a march down River Road. And it's important to also understand that on that night, it rained. The, the road became very muddy, but despite that, 
they had made a decision that this was the day and the time and the hour to strike and they struck and they headed off to New Orleans and they went from plantation to plantation and as they went down River Road towards New Orleans, um, they were joined uh, by other enslaved Africans uh, that was based upon the work that they had done secretly. And they went from plantation to plantation. Unfortunately, uh, when they struck the Andrew Plantation, there was supposed to be an arsenal there, and that had been removed. So they were only able to get a few weapons. And as they went from plantation to plantation, they were only uh, able to get a few weapons. A lot of people have always asked me, well, why didn't they burn down all the plantations? And the answer to that, of course, is that they believed that this was going to be their land. These were going to be their buildings. So why would you destroy something that was going to be part of your infrastructure after you seized power? So they understood very well that this was a struggle for power. They were trying to reach the colonial seat, New Orleans. And they had people inside the city of New Orleans whose task it was to attack Fort St. Charles, which is the U.S. met on Esplanade today. Their task was to attack that fort, seize the weapons, and pass them out to the slave army once it reached New Orleans. Unfortunately, uh, it, it was betrayed, and uh, Gilbert was turned in by his uncle. He was put on trial and, uh, and, and, and executed for uh, being part of the revolt. Uh, but what is important for us to understand that there was a very real possibility given the balance of forces and if the enslaved had been able to seize the weapons that they thought were available, they probably could have seized New Orleans and touched off a major conflagration that would have invited all the enslaved in the whole territory to come to New Orleans and join the revolt. And with the balance of forces of Spain being opposed to the United States, they could have made alliances with the native people and Spain to fight against the United States, and we could have had a very different outcome of the colonial period uh, in, 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 um, in Louisiana. I'll stop there and, and ask a question. Thank you. We're going to open it up to a question and answer session now. So if any of you would like to comment, you would like to ask questions, feel free to do so. I can mention some things. I know, um, and not only in Louisiana, but in some other areas of the South, um, it, um, because of the revolution, actually the planters um, began to really tighten down on some of the liberties that the slaves had before the revolution. And I know one instance as far as you know, dealing with religion, there was churches that were um, established by blacks. And after the revolution, although you know some of the plan planters let the slaves have this structure as a church and to worship, after the revolution they made sure that whites were in the services. Um, sure, you can continue with your, your religious services, but we're going to plant somebody here uh, to make sure because everybody was really paranoid then about you know others getting together and revolting. Um, and so some of the liberties I know, uh, even the slaves would be able to move from plantation to plantation. They would have to have um, a little pass, but some of this was cut out too. And so it's just a, a couple of examples specifically uh, dealing with um, enslaved people through this. Great. I guess what I wanted to, I guess, add to my earlier talk was that uh, the other uh, result was changes in the civil code because we were under French then Spanish 
both have their own slave codes. The Spanish, though, freed more slaves. Enslaved. Our free population grows under the Spanish, as does slavery, because the Spanish brought five to six amount, maybe 40, 50,000 Africans are brought under the Spanish, where only four to 5,000 Africans are brought during the French. But with the, uh, the immigration, you have people like Moreau de Lay, who's a white Saint Domingue lawyer. And he's the, the, the co-author of the Louisiana Civil Code. So law is codified that is probably a little more favorable to free people of color, because they do allow emancipation a little bit longer by 1825, emancipation becomes more restricted. And really, uh, it's more close to the 1850s that laws against free people of color are very, oh, that's when free people of color start to leave. They go to Mexico, they actually go to Haiti, or, or going to Europe. So, but uh, Lalay is an important judge, who's a San Domingue, who was actually in the revolutionary government of Haiti. So he was, someone was calling, he was probably one of the last whites to leave Haiti. Because he probably left either 1800 or just after 1800 and ends up in Louisiana. Uh, there were uh, sanctuary laws that forbade free women of color, particularly from wearing certain kinds of clothing and uh, fringes. Well, that was from the Spanish. You, you, you're, you're probably, when you're talking about the Tino law, the Tino, it's actually that's Nero's band of good government from 1784, but that was like 50 laws dealing with slavery, uh, not just, and basically what the law said, a free woman of color, if she wore her hair a certain way, she had to have it covered. If it was flat or straight, she didn't have to have it covered. So it doesn't say she had to wear the chignon, it just, it was more about the style, but free woman of color could not wear hats, they weren't supposed to wear feathers, but the chignons were more elaborate, and so white women started wearing chignons to compete with the fashion statement imposed by the free women. But yeah, that was from the, the Spanish period. Any other questions? Comments, additions, <laughs> yes. also were from St. Domingue. No, can you mention some of the names of the families in St. Tammany Parish? The Ducrees. Calatus. Okay, they came by, by way of Cuba. And the Judis family. Okay. Making what? They were traditional court bylaws. Okay. I'm a court archivist in St. Tammany, and I'm a historian, and I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. So when I moved to this part of the country, I had a lot of catching up to do, a lot of learning, and uh, I found it just fascinating. I didn't know what all that meant, so I tried to learn more. So thanks. Well, did you did you write about this anywhere, or no? Just... I've never wrote it up. Okay. Um, but our collection up in St. Tammany Parish goes back to the year 1786 in unique records, and we have one of the largest uh, 
judicial collections that's held on site in the parish in the state of Louisiana. So it's a huge collection. Okay, well that's good to know. <laughs> Any other additions that people might want to talk about? We have a few more minutes here before we have to give up the stage mm -hmm. for the next panel. Yes, John? <laughs> um, Josh, I want to know, uh, I was wondering uh, if uh, you could uh, comment on any uh, religious uh, um, influences uh, on Louisiana that may still be, uh, you know, being practiced that are stem from uh, Haiti. Okay. Well, we actually will have a panel on voodoo <laughs> next. I think it's. Uh, Sunday. <laughs> um, yes, it, uh, quite a bit was, um, um, yeah, as, as far as religion is concerned, um, we had in that mass migration or in those mass migrations, because, you know, it was through the revolution as well as after the revolution, as Greg has said, but along with the folks that came, there were voodoo uh, priests and priestesses, although they, they tried to... Um, sort of keep them in a clandestine way you know they didn't want them to be really uh, known but there were some that came and of course it was very easy to continue that afro-based religion here because of catholicism um, and many things could be you might say veiled uh, within the, uh, the catholic religion so yes, voodoo was uh, very prominent here for many years, um, it, it, and it was very open actually for a while. And and after a while, um, they began to uh, suppress it. Uh, and again, because of the media and because of things that happened, some some deaths were blamed on voodoo, and a lot of the deaths were really not caused by the voodoo practitioners, but folks would uh, make it appear so because they would, um, you know, around the person who was dead, they would put blood or some other elements uh, uh, just to make it seem like it was done by, uh, you know, within a voodoo ceremony. So uh, it sort of went underground for a while. And I also have to mention that one of the um, folklores, uh, you all may know, of Zora Neale Hurston actually came here to look at that and went through the process of becoming a voodoo practitioner herself. Uh, she had been to Haiti and also um, to, um, to, and then came to New Orleans. This course was many years later, but I just had to mention that because she was a folklorist and uh, studied uh, voodoo through the act of actually going through the practice herself. But yeah, voodoo was a, a major uh, religion uh, from Haiti that, uh, that came into Louisiana. And, and most people look at Louisiana as um, um, a huge area for voodoo practice um, and it was for a number of years you don't see it so much now but there are still some practitioners that are here but I also have to say that not only the voodoo religion but in North Louisiana there's a ritual that goes on um, and I you know we're still trying to figure out what are the um, ante antecedents of this particular religion because the rituals uh, very much Afro-based, and uh, but actually it's through a Baptist church, and so we can't put it all on Catholicism. But you know, the Baptist also had, you know, was sort of you might say tolerant of of other um, rituals coming into play. And, but of course, these were plantation churches, very small uh, rural plantation churches. You, you couldn't see that happening in a large urban church. But even today, that ritual still goes on in North Louisiana, and I'm really thinking that it has some, um, you know, Haitian influence in it too. So, of course, looking at the the ethnic groups um, that were on these plantations in North Louisiana. So, um, so I haven't really confirmed all of that yet, but I'm really thinking there's some Haitian influence in that too. Uh, on the free population of color. Because they doubled the free population, you see Louisiana born free people intermarrying with San Domingue free people. For example, Marie Laveau, husband was from Port au Prince, Jacques Paris, and her half sister, Marie Dolores Laveau, husband was Francois Auguste, who was also from Haiti. Uh, so you, uh, and then Sanit Nade was a voodoo priestess born in Haiti. Uh, so definitely this tremendous, but. You, 
because of the local free population of color was burgeoning, when the San Domain people come up, they just double and by natural increase. So the free population of New Orleans is intricately connected to the free people of Haiti and the free Africans and, and the slave population well. But I do want to, yes, uh, St. Tammany we just is the pond. So in the immediate area, Jefferson Parish, St. Bernard, Plaquemine Parish, German Coast, and then there were probably some refugees who went out to Point Coupee, uh, New Iberia area, where some of the other sugar plantation was, uh, to either buy plantations or, uh, but anywhere where you had sugar, you would have had some Saint Domingue, but the most impact was in the New Orleans, greater New Orleans area, as far as people and demographics. And I just want to mention too, I was pulling out the schedule just to let you know that the, um, the panel on uh, voodoo practices in Haiti and New Orleans will be tomorrow from 3 to 4, so just in case those of you who might be interested. Uh, any more comments, questions? Well, I would also uh, like to thank the sponsors of this particular area, the whole uh, cultural crossroads area, um, the uh, Green Family Foundation, as well as the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. So um, we'd like to give them a shout out because um, they really gave some of the funding for this particular area. So, But to let you know that there will be two more panels. The next one coming up is uh, Haitian immigrants and their descendants, and another one, Haitian influence on New Orleans architecture. Those are the two more that are following us today. And we'll have three tomorrow and three on Sunday. So if there are any more questions or comments, we're going to end this session. Thank you.